comments are kind of getting ready. I'll uh, introduce Ginger and then Ginger will say something, but I'll say something and Honest will roll. So. Okay. All right. Um, so this uh, program is brought to you by Humanities Kansas, and uh, we have a new board member that's from here in Hayes, uh, Ginger Williams, who's the Dean of Forsyth Library. So she's going to just say a few things uh, on Humanities Kansas for half, on her, their behalf, and then we'll go wrong. So. I'm going to read that because they gave me a shirt to read these guys. So. Um, my name is Ginger Williams. I am a new board member from Humanities Kansas. I've been to one meeting so far. It was pretty wonderful. If you have any questions oh, about yes, yeah. the work of Humanities Kansas, we'd be happy to, to chat with you afterwards. Um, but Humanities Kansas is leading a movement of ideas across Kansas in partnership with museums, historical societies, and other organizations like the Hayes Public Library. Together, we're exploring history, ideas, traditions, and literature, and making important connections between people in place over time and across generations. Since our founding, Hayes has partnered with Humanities Kansas numerous times over the years to host speakers through events. So congratulations, this is a community that values the exchange of ideas. I'm here today to say thank you on behalf of Humanities Kansas. Thank you to the local coordinators who make events like this happen, and to the speakers who come out and share their knowledge with us. Um, and thank you to all of you in the audience who come and support this work. If you'd like more information about Humanities Kansas, just let me know. That's a pretty good script. Yeah. <laughs> well, my name is Jeremy Gill. I'm the Kansas Room Coordinator here at the Hayes Public Library. I'm sure some of you have got an email from me a couple different times over the past uh, week, week and a half or so. I appreciate you for taking time out of your evening to be here. Um, I know it's really hard to always find a perfect date on any of this stuff because I got responses back like, oh, I'd love to be here, but I have an Arts Council meeting or, so, or something along those lines. So I really do appreciate you for taking time out to come here and learn about city and uh, county government. So not everyone would do that probably. So I do really appreciate that and appreciate elected officials for being here as well. Um, today we're pleased to welcome Hannah Zacharias uh, for a presentation on city and county governments in Kansas, what they do and how they are financed. Our program is brought to us by, like Ginger said, Humanities Kansas, an independent nonprofit leading a movement of ideas to empower the people of Kansas to strengthen the communities and, the, and our democracy. We here at the Hayes Public Library benefit greatly from Humanities Kansas through grants and programs and all different kinds of stuff. So they're a really fabulous organization. Uh, please take this moment to turn off your cell phones um, so that we may all enjoy the program. As we begin, let's remember that the information presented as well as what we share and discuss is of value and of interest. We will respect one another even if we have different points of view. Not that I think that we're going to get any kind of argument over who's going to finish this. <laughs> Hannes currently serves as the Robert A. Kidd Professor of Practice in Public Administration at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. He has over 35 years of experience in city and county government and jurisdictions, both small and large, holding positions, positions such as management analysis for the city of Lawrence, city manager for the city of Hayes, and assistant county manager, deputy county manager, and county manager for Johnson County, Kansas. And then how I learned uh, from, from Hannes and our particular interest of ours was the Arkansas River, where not only that he had all these other crazy things to do in government, but he decided in 2018 uh, to embark on a second solo kayak trip on the Arkansas River, paddling a total of 2,060 miles. So I can, I bet he's the only public administrator that's ever done that. So <laughs> that's probably yeah, probably yeah, the only wacky enough to do it. Yeah, so it. I'd like to welcome uh, Honest Back to the Hayes Public Library. Well, thanks, sir. I appreciate it. You all are very kind. Thank you very much. And uh, appreciate it to, to spend some time with you to talk about uh, local governments in Kansas. I, I am uh, a bit uh, nervous about this presentation because some of you already have all this information, perhaps. Uh, and I don't want to uh, be so based to kind of insult your intelligence, but I find in these presentations, I start from ground zero and work up. So I go basically from general to specific uh, and go from that. So, so I, in, uh, please indulge me as we talk about that. Uh, this kind of work. Because some of you have such deep knowledge that this may be somewhat um, rudimentary, uh, but hopefully you'll find it interesting as we go forward here. You'll find a little tidbits that will be helpful. Um, I have given you note cards because I want you to write down questions. So I'll, I'll get you out of here by 7.30 uh, on the dot, but I'm going to pause about 45 minutes in to you, for you all to go and give me your questions or areas of interest. I can talk a lot about these subjects city, counties, and so forth in Kansas and things going on, but I'm really more curious about what your appetite is, what are your questions, and we can kind of then go from that point. So please take a moment to do that. You don't have to write it down necessarily, but it's kind of a prompting mechanism. So if you hear something or think of something, 
Uh, let's go ahead and bring those issues forward for the second half of the presentation here. Here's what the agenda is. I'm going to talk about my background. I'm going to talk about local governments in general from a, a global perspective, uh, services, taxes, and topics of special interest. That's going to be our, uh, our agenda for this evening. I want to start with my background, just kind of give you some reasons why you should be listening to me. I've been in the world for 33, 35 years. I started out in Lawrence, Kansas, as after I worked for the Department of Travel and Tourism for the state of Kansas. Uh, I was the actual assistant director, which was great, but I was the, the only two of us in the entire office, so I was the one that kind of drove across the state delivering all the products to the branch locations, Midland and Liberal and Wichita and so forth. Uh, then worked for the federal government, which is called the Ozarks Regional Commission underneath the governor's office, administering economic development grants for various communities to go and develop industrial parks and so forth. Uh, that came to a conclusion uh, because when the Reagan administration came in, I was one of the first Reagan firees because he eliminated all the Title V commissions. That sent me packing. That's when I then worked for the Kansas Arts Commission as their assistant director. And I found out at that time if I wanted to go and do this kind of work to go and help build communities and community relations, I better get my master's in public administration. I did so at the University of Kansas. That led me then to apply for a position in Lawrence and became the person that was in charge for downtown Lawrence for about four years, uh, working for my mentor, Buford Watson, who was an icon in our industry and in our business. Um, that uh, then he said, you know, if you're in a way you want to be in city management, I'm about to be a city manager. So I went out to Boonville, Missouri. You know where Boonville, Missouri is? Anybody know where Boonville? There you go. We have three exits on the interstate. It's interesting because for our profession, it's always we. We, we, we did something. It's like I'm still there. I'm not there, but that was, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, big projects, putting a new bridge across the Missouri River in downtown development and casino work. So I did that. Well, that and the Katy Trail. If you remember the Katy Trail, we were the first ones to put the Katy Trail in the state of Missouri, and that was wonderful. Got a chance then to come to Hayes America, yes, uh, in, the, in the 90s, uh, which was a wonderful experience for me. And uh, we have talked about the water before. I won't bore you to death on that sort of stuff, but I'm really curious and excited about the R9 Ranch. And I already said earlier, when that happens, I want to be here for the ribbon cutting. I did a lot of work on that project. Then I was applying for a job to go into Colorado and be a, a, be a suburban manager outside the Denver area. I get a call saying, well, we have a position open in Johnson County. Uh, to go and be an assistant county manager, and you haven't applied for it. I said, well, why should I apply? Uh, I'm, I'm a city, you're a county, you have water, we don't have water. You're east, I'm west, you are large, I'm small, why should I apply? I said, well, apply anyway. So I did and got the position and became in charge of all the shuns, uh, that being you know, apprehension, prosecution, adjudication, uh, incarceration, rehabilitation of the offender population. So I can talk a lot about social services and those sort of things. Uh, with Johnson County that had a chance to go ahead and move up to be deputy county manager in the 2008 for about 10 years was county manager capping stoning up my professional career in a community of 650,000 uh, organization of 1.7 billion dollars and 4,200 employees that was a capstone of my career I tell you that not to go and be self-aggrandizing but to give you some breadth of understanding that may be helpful that might give you some insight about what questions you can ask me uh, as we go forward here um, then in 2018, uh, left the organization, did the Wacky Kayak trip, and then KU came knocking and saying, would you be a professor of practice? Kind of being that person that incorporates the, the learning, uh, the scientific work, the social sciences work with the actual practical application. And that's what I'm doing right now, along with Humanities Kansas. So enough about me. Let's talk about history of local governments in general. Uh, and I will talk about, um, let's, let's go back some time here. Let's first of all talk about history of counties, Roman occupation of Great Britain, Julius Caesar in 55 BC. We can see here by, by this information here how the areas where jurisdictions were, were broken up. In fact, this is Hadrian's Wall. This is still the border between uh, England and Scotland. So it started, you know, almost 2,000 years ago in terms of local jurisdiction administration uh, coming forward here. Uh, then, of course, and, and this is actually from 369. Uh, AD afterwards, uh, you can see all the various roads that they put in place. So the derivation of local administration really kind of starts with the Roman Empire coming forward. Then in the fifth century, uh, then we started having shires coming into place. And Shire uh, really was a, a, a location that as we transition from Roman rule to now into fiefdoms and into small uh, areas for kingdoms, uh, the king or queen or the duke and so forth had to have somebody to go ahead and administer the taxes. So they decided to go ahead and create basically shires. It's a German term uh, meaning the official in charge. 
The Shire Reeve was elected by the serfs to watch over his fellow serfs, kind of be the one that kind of would, would be in place of the lamb of the Lord. Uh, that then morphs into Shire, Shire Reeve, which is from sheriff. That's how we get the term sheriff from translating from, from Great Britain. Uh, then the change in with the Roman con the, the Norman conquest in 1066, Shire is going to change to Conte, a fr the French term, which then gets morphed over into counties. That gets transitioned over to us in the Virginia colonies in the 1600s, where the actual Virginia colonies were actually shires. Uh, they were not, they, were, they then kind of transmitted from that point and eventually changed their name over to counties years later to kind of conform with what was happening uh, in Great Britain at that point in time. So that gives you kind of a sense that local administration and local governments uh, really has its roots in Western democracies with the Roman Empire, coming by all the way to our today and how we got our, what our system going forward in the United States. The United States has uh, the, the, uh, the, the 10th Amendment of the Constitution is important, that provides the basis for all that we do in local governments, saying that indeed the power is not delegated to the United States uh, by the Constitution nor prohibited by it into the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. That's where we get states, that's where we get everything else that comes from it. So that's an important document to kind of think about where does this authority come from? That's where it comes from. Let's talk about the evolution of local governments here. So we have, first of all, counties, and counties were first settled in colonial times. We talked about that, very early settlers, to provide that local government, to be that way to kind of connect with the state governments in this case, to go ahead and provide uh, local services and provide that, that level of engagement. Uh, we then transitioned into townships later on to bring local government closer to people, mostly in rural areas. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic mid areas and so forth did not have as much robust work as Midwestern states. Now, why is that? Thomas Jefferson decided to go ahead and develop the township, uh, the range, and um, section form of government. The, the idea of kind of putting it all together to kind of, uh, that primarily is involved with the areas west of Mississippi. If you look at land records in Louisiana and Georgia and so forth, they're not a township range and section model. They're actually slivers going off of the rivers. Very convoluted as far as that's concerned. But townships come into play as a way to go ahead and provide that level of oversight, that level of of providing additional services uh, that the states could not do by themselves. That then morphed into cities and towns and so forth, providing rural services, fire, police protection, streets, libraries, etc. Few cities and villages exist in the colonial area. Most were established during the early and middle years of the 19th century. New cities and villages continue to be established as new settlement patterns convert rural land to urban use. So as urbanization occurs, cities then start to be, be established because it was felt that the counties were not in a position to go ahead and, and augment the services and provide more services that the, the, the county uh, was unable or unwilling to go and provide. I think it's interesting to talk about here in terms of fire and police protection. There's nothing in the Constitution says that everybody shall have fire protection, that everybody shall have police protection. There is right now in terms of the counties providing police protection, but it's interesting that the fire departments are kind of a, an interesting example. Uh, back in the 1920s and so forth, you had a fire, Remember, the, the, the fire departments have a shield. See how that's kind of, that comes from the idea that if you had, if you paid your insurance, then indeed they put a ceramic shield on your property. And if indeed the fire happened, they would then crank up the fire department and come out to you. And if you had a shield, they'd squirt water on it. If you didn't have the shield, they didn't do a thing for you. What they did is they, they, they threw water on the neighbor and the one that did have a shield to make sure it didn't catch on that area. But if you didn't pay your, uh, your fee, you didn't get buckets. Right? So there was a desire to go ahead and establish a communal, uh, if, if you will, process to go ahead and collect dollars to go and provide fire service. But there's no guarantee that you have to have that. Johnson County is an example. We have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the area of the old Sunflower Army Ammunition Plant. It's about 7,000 acres. It's not part of a fire district. It's not required to. They've now negotiated to kind of do some things by contract, but every year the fire district kind of negotiates and say, you want fire protection this year or not? Um, so I want to I want to basically lay the foundation that some of the services we're used to um, are we're not there all the time and there's no legislation that requires it as far as having fire protection those sort of things. So cities were established to go ahead and provide that level of additional services. Um, then we have school districts come into play as well. School districts were, were designed as a way to go and keep schools and politicians out of the politics of schools. Um, school districts were established in the late 19th and early centuries. Voters attempted to take control of schools away from corrupt politicians, so we established school districts. You may recall back in the 60s in Kansas, 
We established unified school districts. We have prior to the 1960s, every individual schoolhouse had their own individual school board. You elected that point. So we finally decided to consolidate the school districts in Kansas to try to bring those things together. So kind of more of the history of how this stuff come, comes together. Then all of a sudden we come into special districts to circumvent tax limits, local power, geographic boundaries, and so forth. Special districts have now come to the forefront. The number has been increasing huge in the middle 20th century. Uh, boundaries existing local governments sometimes to create additional governments that will be added, tax barring, barring powers, and so forth. We'll talk about that, show some, some information that gives you a more robust amount of information about that in just a second. Um, the interesting thing about this is you're talking about great proliferation of the number of, number of local governments, lack of uniformity, this leads to all these things, lack of uniformity in local government boundaries, problems of service coordination, voter confusion and apathy, higher taxes and government spending. We love government. We love it. We have so many of them. because We're about, all about local control, which adds to the overhead and, and the inefficiencies that we have in government, trying to make all those things come together, which I think is fascinating. In Kansas, is number three in the country, which is incredible as far as that's I actually talked about making this lecture saying that Kansas loves government. Because uh, they really kind of get that impression of the number of governments we have coming together. So I think as we talk about the proliferation of all these different levels of government, it really does lead to higher taxes and government spending because you have to go and support the mechanisms to keep this all, all this stuff going forward. How much so? Well, we have some, some transitions here. County count of governments throughout the years, 1942 to 1917, has gone down quite a bit, but it's not kind of coming up to a degree 90,000 local governments nationwide, which is a huge, huge number. Uh, as we talk about it. Um, let's talk about counties in general. Counties in the United States are the largest territorial division of local government within the United States. Um, every place is governed by a parish uh, or, a, a, uh, or a county or those who are kind of activities uh, in the United States. So everything is governed that way. Let's talk about the size of the counties. What I find interesting about this map is you look at the number of counties on the eastern port and now look at the number of counties on the western side. You're talking about the proliferation of Jefferson's vision of the range, township, and section property coming into place where counties are much larger in the west than they are in the east. Uh, and we'll talk about Kansas specifically here in just a second, but it gives you that, that kind of uh, visual about how we've migrated toward uh, really larger counties the further west you go as we talk about western expansion. A little over 3,000 county governments overall. 47 of the states have functioning county governments. Three states without functioning. They, they still have a county jurisdiction in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, but they have no official power. Uh, they are basically uh, map lines on a map uh, for, um, I guess, uh, purposes of property appraisals and those sort of things. Um, so those reviews really don't do it. Uh, they have parishes and boroughs in Alaska. Uh, it gives you some sense of the scale of different types of counties. Let's remember that one of the biggest counties is indeed uh, the area of uh, Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County Sheriff, is, the city of Los Angeles did not provide all the fire and police protection, that's the county does that kind of work. So every county is a little bit different as far as that is concerned. Let's talk about then uh, the number of cities and towns and villages. United States, 2019, about 19,000 of them. The majority of them, 16,000 or below 10,000. That gives you a sense that way. Uh, more than a million, only 10 or more than a million, but there's much more than just a million. You're talking 10 million, 15 million, and so forth in some cases. But the number is pretty small. Uh, getting in these categories here. The vast majority are these uh, under 10,000. You can see that as far as Kansas is concerned, coming forward that way. Um, let's talk about school districts as part of local government as well. A uh, number of school districts, uh, 13,200 in, uh, in 2022 uh, nationwide. Enrollment you can see varies from very large places in New York City. And per, per pupil spending kind of just gives you an idea about uh, what, per, what per pupil spending is in various school districts. Uh, get that kind of comparison in your head, if you would like. Um, then we talk about special districts that come into proliferation. These are the number of, of states with the highest count of special districts 2017. Kansas is here, the number of 1,493. If you look at that, the number per capita, we are number three in the country, uh, behind South Dakota and North Dakota. So we love our special districts. Uh, we love our levels of government and so forth coming into Kansas more than any place else in the country, uh, almost virtually. It gives you a sense about the proliferation of special districts. 
Well, what do these special districts do? Here's the list of stuff that special districts do in the country. Uh, local fire protection list, heads the list, uh, water supply, cemetery districts, libraries, parks and recreation, irrigation, um, you know, health and so forth. One thing I don't see here, but I know other places have, is mosquito eradication districts. Um, so it becomes really a large thing going on about what we want to do is our little small, small corner of the world, we want to go and uh, create the district, elect people in that way, and then administer and collect the taxes to make all that work. Uh, total around almost 40,000 special districts. Uh, as we talked about in Kansas, more close to home, gives you more of a precise thing about what the, what the number of districts are. Uh, cemetery districts, airport authorities, um, these are very familiar with you, I'm sure. Uh, as you look at, at these, there's a whole list of those that the U.S. Census keeps track of, of the number of governments that are around in these special districts. Let's not forget something, though, in Kansas that is unique as far as local governments are concerned, that being tribal governance. Tribal governance is important uh, in Kansas, and particularly those areas that are west of us that we often just don't get, we give short shrift to. Here are the number of areas that are federally recognized tribal lands. Huge amounts of vast property. Look at Oklahoma. Almost you know, two-thirds of the entire state is indeed tribal land and so forth. And why that's important is because um, there's a whole different mechanisms for the individual nations that, that people are talking about here. In Kansas, we have the Prairie Band of Potawatomi's that have this section of property. We have the Kickapoo. We have the Sac Fox and the Iowa also as well. These are individual nations uh, as we talk about. And so their connection with local governments is totally different in the conversation trying to go ahead and do services that would transcend existing boundaries than you might think. And we have to provide a lot of respect for that. Uh, tribal governments are important, unique members. The U.S. Constitution recognizes that tribal nations are sovereign governments just like Canada and California. It says the Congress shall have the power, you look it up, Article 1, Section 8, have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and with Indian tribes. So it's not just something that kind of is, part, is out there, but it's actually part of the U.S. Constitution, uh, and I think we should be aware of that as we, as we go forward here. Um, there are about 580 sovereign tribal nations uh, currently in the United States. That's a lot of them. Most of them, I think, are residing in, in Alaska, uh, but they're transiting about 36 different states in the country. And we, we sometimes don't think about that level of local government being tribal governments. Uh, tribal governments maintain the power to determine their own governance structures, pass laws, enforce laws. In fact, they have their own police departments that are both qualified for state as well as that are qualified by the FBI. So they may actually have more jurisdiction than county officers or individual street officers uh, because they have their uh, license by the FBI. Uh, provide multiple programs, first responders, all these sort of things come into play. This is just more information about Justice Marshall talking about the sovereignty of nations. I find it interesting because in talking with the folks at the Prairie Band Potawatomi Council just the other day, they don't collect property taxes and they're not allowed to because the property is actually held in trust to the individuals that are part of that tribe. And those individual tribe members may be across the world. They, they, they deserve to go and get some return on that investment. So the only form of revenue they have for the Prairie Band Potawatomi is the casino. Uh, so that day you can see why casinos are such a big deal for the Native American population. Because that's their only source of revenue to provide for streets and those sort of things coming up forward that way. So I just want to give you a landscape of local governments starting from the general area, from uh, the Roman conquest time periods to present day, covering all these various districts. Let's now get into Kansas as far as that is concerned and some specifics that way. Local government in Kansas. 103 counties. Now, why do we say 103 versus 100? Well, 100, 105 counties. Well, according to the census population, no, it's only 103 because Greeley County and Wyandotte County are combined governments. So the U.S. Census basically says, no, they're cities, they're not counties. We still call them counties because that's what the statute requires me to go ahead and say. 624 cities, townships, almost, thir almost you know, 1,300 townships that indeed do have taxing authority as far as that is concerned. School District 306, and look at the number of special districts, 1,400, uh, that are statewide as far as that's concerned. Let's give a comparison, I think, between Colorado and Kansas in terms of the number of special districts, because I think there's some implications here about how we view special districts. Now, I'll point out Colorado because we heard the Tabor Amendment, which basically put a property tax lid on Colorado's property taxes. You can see here what happened, the proliferation of special districts since that had been put in place almost doubling, tripling different, different special districts. Why is it important? 
because somebody has to pay for the roads, somebody has to pay for police departments, somebody has to pay for fire departments and so forth, so they create all these special assessment districts. There's some advantages to that because if it's not a property tax, property tax is basically, there are so many exemptions, religious institutions, corporations in some cases and so forth. Special districts don't have those exemptions. You pay regardless of your area that, that's you know, the exempt and so forth. It's a bill to buy, to buy that level of service. I talked to some managers in Colorado here recently and they're just happy as clams because they're able to go ahead and do what they want to do by the proliferation of special districts. So it's not like the uh, property tax that is a pan panacea, it's just now getting the, the dollars in a different way. I think that's the point of my conversation here. Let's talk about county governments in Kansas and where, where county governments get their, their power from. It's from this area of the Constitution uh, that talks about the legislature shall provide uh, the number of, of governments and give up counties uh, throughout the state. In fact, Kansas counties act as local governments. Uh, however, all county authority is granted to the state as the county is considered a subdivision of the state. So the, the state of Kansas requires counties to go ahead and provide that level of, of enforcement for various state regulations and requirements. It's a subdivision of the state and why that's important. If you are a county commissioner, you cannot be a state legislator because you're, it's, it's, you can't hold two state offices. If you are a city commissioner, however, you can be a state senator, can be a state legislator because cities are corporations. They indeed are not subdivisions of the state. They're corporations and it, it, they are held differently as far as the statute is concerned going forward. So that's an important distinction. Let's talk about the, uh, the, the growth of counties in Kansas historically. Uh, the first ones were prior to 1861, prior to statehood, we had counties in the eastern part of the state. Then we got more going further to the west as we became statehood, and most recently the ones in 1884 out here as far as that's concerned. Um, so it gives you kind of a general sense as we grew out western, we then came to the point where we needed to have more counties and provide that level of service. Okay. What is the biggest factor in determining the how big a county would be in Kansas? It's how far you can travel on horseback in one day. Um, and that's, that's that how it was created. Probably archaic right now for our, for our system, but try to consolidate a county. Even out further west from here, you can't do it. Even though we have counties that may have 3,000 people, they're so fixated, we're so fixated on the geographical boundaries of our county and the idea of identity. Uh, so it becomes very difficult to go ahead and consolidate uh, county governments because we're so used to it. We're, we're, we're developed as a sense of laws. But I'd argue that sense on horseback is not the way to do it. If you look at the state of Kansas, look at all these county seats. They're virtually all are in the middle of, including Hayes, middle of the county itself for that purpose to go ahead and provide that level of, of connection with the state government uh, so you can get done on a daily basis. Um, two, Kansas counties have two major roles, serve as the administrative arm of the state and also provide locally determined services. Well, what are some of those services? As we administer election process, handle taxation processes, issue license permits, maintain land records and so forth. If, if your land record is not in the county uh, courthouse, you don't own it. You don't own it. That's why it's so important. That's the official records of, of how counties get established. To the point where, where I grew up in God City, they'd actually steal the safe to go ahead and move the city county seat to places to kind of provide economic development because they knew that's where all the that's where all the records were need to be maintained. Provide facilities for the judiciary. Counties are required to pay for the facilities for the judiciary, but don't pay for the actual services. So courthouses and those sort of things are required by the county to pay for. Uh, but the individual judges themselves and the support staff is paid for by the state. That's different in California. California, the state pays all that sort of stuff, the facilities and the administration of the courts. Counties in Kansas get a chance to uh, do it as far as that's concerned, pay for it. Finance, prosecution, those sort of things as well. There are mandated services in Kansas that counties must provide. They must provide public health services, mental health, developmental support services, emergency management, solid waste planning, uh, law enforcement in jails, transportation, roads, bridges, and noxious weeds eradication. Um, so were the city of Hayes go away, the county would have to provide these services and provide some level of, of support for public safety. Maybe not to the same level of the, same, the citizens of Hayes would want to do, but that's their obligation. The cities can go away if they'd like to, and the county then picks up those services as best they can. There are locally generated things you can do as well, what the counties can do. Hospitals, various medical services, home health care, Cultural legal services, economic development, planning, zoning, airports, utilities, and so forth. In fact, Johnson County, 
decided to go ahead and take over the sewer operations in Johnson County because of the proliferation of the small uh, sewer facilities that they decided several years ago to consolidate them and put them beneath the county's jurisdiction. So we we're the largest purveyors of sewers uh, in Johnson County, which was always an interesting thing to talk about. Let's talk about the number of counties that have county hospitals. Gray area talks about those that have county hospitals. And that becomes interesting with regards to Medicare uh, and Medicaid expansion or the absence thereof because they're having a hard time getting the taxes to go ahead and keep these hospitals open. So that's one of the issues being discussed in the legislature for the last five years and so forth. But these counties are very concerned about that, how indeed they can provide that level of service. Let's talk about counties with zoning. Not every part of the state of Kansas is zoned. So if you're out here in Wallace County or down here in Cherokee County, you, you want to build whatever you want to do, go for it. You can put a hog farm right next to a house. You can go ahead and build a shack and live in it. There's no requirement to go ahead and do that. Uh, Ellis County, as you know, did that a few years ago and added to the list. Uh, but I was just, I'm just surprised by the number of counties that there is no zoning, no requirement for building codes or anything else going on. Um, if you're a banker, obviously, you're not going to go and give you a loan uh, because you're not, it's not up to code, but it's no requirement to do that. It really is a requirement of those who are the lending agency to go ahead and be to a certain level of construction. County boards, often three, five, or seven. Board size can be changed by referendum slightly toward larger boards. Johnson and Wyandotte County have other things going on. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, governing body sizes, uh, you can see that these are fellows that have sizes larger than three. Uh, Johnson Wyandotte has 11, Johnson has seven. Others are kind of looking at that uh, as well as they talk about governance. City governments. City governments, uh, Constitution talks about that the legislature will provide a general law for cities, may, may merge, consolidate cities, may be dissolved, and so forth. Uh, I'm emphasizing again, there are municipal cor corporations that are varying in sizes. Uh, some have a lot of staff, some have no staff. Lake Guevara has no staff. It's a city, they contract everything out. They're basically a glorified uh, neighborhood association with having legal jurisdiction to go ahead and assess taxes and those sort of things. So uh, that's an important fundamental difference between cities and counties um, as far as being corporations. Um, Let's talk about general rules that the states use to govern local governments overall. You may have heard these already, but as a, as a broad brush, since we now know that counties and cities are subject to states, what, what sort of rules do the state impose? And there are broad brush, two different distinctions about the authority cities and counties have state by state. One is Dillon's rule. What is Dillon's rule? Gentleman uh, was the uh, Supreme Court Justice in Iowa back in the 1600s. A community on the edge of, of, the, of Iowa was, was protesting that the railroads were coming in and, and building railroads over their rights of way. Uh, and they petitioned the state to say this is illegal, we're a corporation, this should not be allowed. Mr. Dillon finally said that, that, that indeed, uh, sorry, you got to stick it in the cities as far as that's concerned. Since you're creatures of the state, the state can do whatever you want to as far as that is concerned. Uh, so affirms that a sub-state government, which is cities and counties, uh, may engage in an activity only if it is specifically sanctioned by the state itself. It's what I call the cookbook level of legislation. So if you're a county or a city and you want to go and build a roadway, you've got to look at the, at the statute book and say, can I go and build the roadway? Yes, you can build a 40-foot road, roadway. What's your the asphalt mix and so forth, those sort of activities. If it's not in the book, you can't do it. Uh, that is very restrictive, obviously, to go ahead and govern uh, populations and local government, if you're looking at part of that as concern. But that's where Dillon's rule comes from, and many states have adopted that kind of level of understanding. Contrast that with home rule. Home rule basically that says that which governs closer to home is governed best, um, and it basically says that if indeed, here's the philosophy, as opposed to saying um, all you can do is what the legislature says, it says no, we can do anything we want to in the entire world, so long as we're not conflicting with what the state legislature says. Okay? We're, not in we're not in conflict with that. And in fact, it was passed in Kansas in uh, 1961. So it says that we can go ahead and do things except for taxes, excise fees, charges, and so forth, when uh, in lending of taxes and so forth, um, if indeed those and any of the things that are limited or prohibited that are applicable uniformly to all cities in the same class. Um, so state of Kansas makes you said, uh, taxes, excise fees, charges, and so forth, other things uh, are their purview. Um, but if it, and anything else that's in state Latin, state legislation that indeed is not uniformly applicable, uh, you can exempt yourself out. What's an example of this? How many, pardon? You get a charter ordinance. Charter ordinance, exactly right. You get a charter ordinance. Lenexa, for example, 
uh, people are buying beer and drinking alcohol on Sunday, right? I don't know if you do that here or not. I know they're back in Kansas City all the time. That started the city of Lenexa saying, hey, we want to go and provide beer and alcohol sales on Sunday. Look at the statute book. Their statutes were riddled with not being uniform. Third class cities can do this. Second class cities can do this. First class cities can do that. So they developed their own charter ordinance that says, we're going to charter out. We're going to allow beer sales and alcohol sales on Sunday. Put it out there for public review and for protest petitions, all passes and so forth, they start doing it. Well, Olathe says we want to do it too. Or the park says we want to do it too. So it gets catch on like a house of fire across the state of Kansas. Legislature comes back the following year, says we want to go and change the last statute and so forth. They didn't have enough votes to go and change the statute. And that's how we got the idea of now having sales on Sundays, uh, which we didn't have before. Another example, Saline County. The state had occupied all the information with regards to uh, selling of firearms. We know it's ubiquitously applied. But they were frustrated they wanted to have some sort of control over, over, the, uh, over, over those, kind of, uh, those, those firearms. The state has nothing at all about ammunition. So the Saline County uh, Commission decided to go and said, we're going to prohibit the sale of metal jacketed cop killer types of weapons or types of ammunition in Saline County, and they use their charter orders to go ahead and do it. So an important concept that Kansans have is that indeed local government's allowed to go ahead and do home rule in many different ways by virtue of trying to use that local control. Lawrence is using that to go talk about bag ordinances and getting in the areas of, of environmental protection and so forth. So um, that level of conversation is not unique. Many states have that. Uh, not all states do. We're actually called a hybrid state in Kansas as we go forward. So home rule is more about local control. Counties and cities, who does what? Uh, now, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but there's a little short video here that kind of provides some explanation about what cities do and what counties do and what the state does that we might find interesting. I live in Waco, which I guess is also McLennan County. And don't get me wrong, I'm proud to be a Texan, but I'm a city girl at heart. All that county stuff is in the country, right? Uh, hold on there, Missy. Whether you live in the city or not, you're just as much a part of the county as anyone else. That's right. And your state, your city, and your county all have important jobs to do. Are you saying that we've got three governments running the show here? Yeah, that seems like a lot. What do they all do anyway? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's start with you, cowboy. We all love living in the Lone Star State, but the government has a limited purpose and scope. That's one of the reasons the legislature only meets every other year. When it does, it has to make decisions and laws that apply to the entire state as a whole. And it needs a local partner to implement its laws and policies. Well, so who does that? I'm glad you asked. That's where the counties come in. They were created to implement state policies and enforce state laws at the local level. It's where the rubber meets the road on carrying out the state's priorities. You see, the county enforces the state's laws and policies. Counties provide services locally tailored to fit the needs of the local residents. And they can do this because they are run by the locals and connected to the people. Yeah, but isn't the city even more local than the county? That's a great question, one that I'm glad you asked. Cities are local and they provide services, but with limits and within the city limits. If you live in a city, they may provide things like water, electricity, and waste removal. Bigger cities have a police force and the city may build certain streets. Well, that sounds like everything I need. What else is there? Well, I'm glad you asked. That brings me back to your county. Your county government fills the gap providing things that the state and city government do not. It provides law enforcement countywide. It runs the court system. When there are bad guys, it keeps the jails where they stay. It registers voters and holds elections for everything from local government offices to the President of the United States. Counties keep track of records like deeds, birth certificates, and death certificates. Counties build and maintain about half the roads in Texas. The county provides health care to lower income residents. It provides emergency management during times of crisis. And the county often collects taxes on behalf of other entities like school districts and cities. Are you getting the picture? Wow, that's a lot. Yes, it is. Oh, so I get it. 
The county is actually the political subdivision enabled by the Texas Constitution to carry out state laws, but with direct and connected relationship to the people it serves. Very good, city gal. Yes, you are Texans and may live in the city, but remember, you are also proud county residents too. Thank you, big voice in the sky. We can stop there. Cities and counties just talk about, a nice little neat little video, kind of give you the sense of interconnectedness of that we talk about that some people are not aware of. Counties and cities, uh, counties typically have more departments, more elected officials. County government boards are elected part on a partisan basis, whereas cities indeed are done alone on a nonpartisan basis, at least currently in the state of Kansas. And we talk about state officials and local officials being both. Let's talk about more about cities and counties. Uh, counties have far less authority to, or discretion for to raise local revenues than cities do. Uh, counties are relatively more dependent on local property taxes to finance the services than cities. Let's talk about management. Uh, there are various forms of gaming management, both for cities and counties, what we call the commission, council manager, commission manager, strong mayor, council, all being somewhat different. Very few of these now have commission form of government, which basically says you run as a, as a police commissioner or as a park commissioner or, or as a road commissioner and so forth. Topeka used to have this, this form of government. They got rid of it about uh, seven, 10 years ago. Uh, council manager is certainly a one that you are familiar with, commission more so here, and strong mayor council, which is a different form of government, which really kind of elects a mayor that then the manager works for that individual. I'm gonna show you another quick video to talk about uh, the importance of what I call professional city management and uh, professional management period, both for cities and counties. We'll watch this for you in a minute video. Which form of local government provides the best structure for community mm -hmm. success? You are probably familiar with the mayor council or strong mayor form. Here, the people elect one politician, the mayor, to lead the community, hire staff, and oversee all day-to-day -day operations and service delivery. Having a single politician at the top of the structure has its disadvantages. The elected council is largely unable to effect change because the mayor is solely responsible for the budget and staffing. Political agendas can contaminate what should be transparent, ethical, and efficient service delivery. And it also leaves that go-to person more susceptible to the influence of special interest groups, leaving ordinary voters with less say about what goes on in their community. The council manager form of government was created to combat corruption and provide for the professional management of local governments. In the council manager form, the people elect a council, including a mayor, and they collectively create a vision for the community and set policy. The council then hires a non-political professional manager based on experience and credentials who implements the council's policy and delivers services equitably. The manager remains accountable to the council because if at any time the council decides that person is ineffective, they can vote to replace the manager. Having the entire elected council setting policy makes it difficult for special interest groups to influence policy. But the council manager form of government isn't just about curtailing corruption. It's about managing services in ways that get better results. An IBM report found that council manager cities are nearly 10% more efficient than mayor council cities. Historically, nearly two thirds of US municipalities with Moody's AAA bond ratings are council manager as are the majority of all America's city award recipients. So visit ICMA.org today to learn more about how your community can adopt or retain the council manager form of government. That's a quick little snippet, but I think it's reinforced the idea about why you have managers. And Hayes has had a long tradition of, county, of city managers, which I think is really good, and recently adopted a county manager situation, which I applaud as well. Uh, not many indeed do have that in the state of Kansas. Here's what the organization charts look like a little bit differently. This is Lawrence organization chart, assistance managers, parks, recreation, finance, pretty typical economic development and so forth, fire, medical, all you part of that. Contrast that with Finney County. And talking about the level of departments that are here, but here's what I point out is these red circles. All these are individually elected individuals from the entire county at large. So let's talk about the group dynamics about the county commission can do the budget, but the, sheriff, the county sheriff says, horse hockey, I've got more political uh, 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 I guess acceptance than you do. It causes a great deal of tension 
about how that can work. So there's a dynamic that I think county structures are inherent by virtue of everybody being kind of at that same level, if you will, of being elected officials, which you don't have in city governments. Uh, you have that through the, through the city manager, uh, former government, dif differently. Johnson County is a little bit different. These are the level of departments here. County commissioners are elected, sheriff and district attorney are elected, uh, but the other positions were actually consolidated and were appointed by the county manager at that time. The number of county administrators the state of Kansas has uh, is limited, but I really think that's a growth area as we talk about it. So I'm going to stop there uh, and try to, uh, that's kind of the, the landscape uh, before I go into that wonderful world of property taxes and the history of property taxes and revenue raising and so forth. I want to stop there to do two things, allow you to go to the restroom if you'd like to go ahead and do that, but I'd also like to go ahead and hear what you are curious about and what you want to have me talk about for the remainder of the 45 minutes. Yes, sir. You, you said you were the assistant county manager in Johnson County. Now, I think our, it's called the county administrator in a lot of counties, but like in Johnson and Cedric, it's called the county manager. Is there any difference between a county administrator and a county manager? It, it depends how the charter is put together. Uh, so the, na the names are, 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 are irrelevant to what authority does that person have. Does that person have the authority to go ahead and hire and fire people that they're responsible for, or they have to go ahead and go through uh, through the commission to go into those activities? So they they can be synonymous uh, in terms of what sort of the really defining factor is what sort of authority do they have? Um, so in this case, the county manager and the county administrator are really have the same level of authority, typically in both locations. Uh, they don't have authority over certain other positions, but typically administrative, they're pretty much the same. And I was assistant county manager, then deputy county manager, and then county manager. So yeah. Does that help? Yes, sir. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the, the scope of contracting out some of these services at the county level. There's a variation across the counties. Uh, in terms of you know, contracting out, yeah, that makes sense. We can talk a lot about that. I'm writing a note here, so. Um, Let me see it. I'll hold that note for a second. What other questions do you have and topics you want me to go ahead and cover? Anything else come to mind that you're curious about? I came here to, to learn about X. Yeah. Okay, now look at the home rule powers. I think our city, I think they're limited on that. How much bond the indebtedness they can incur? Are there any other limitations? Or is there a, I believe there is a limitation on that each class of incorporated the city can incur. Like first, second, third class. Yes, the, uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, I'll get back to the idea with the country and this, and we'll kind of have as we go along. There are uh, statutory requirements uh, or limitations on uh, bonded indebtedness. Uh, I do believe, however, that cities could indeed go beyond that if they wanted to by charter. So it's not uniformly applied. It's going to be, like you said, first class, second class, and third class. The ones that really are governing that are the, the bond houses. Uh, they are not going to allow individuals, they're not going to give you a good bond rating if indeed you have, uh, you have your debt service level is so far out, out of whack. Uh, I'm finding that bonding entities and other folks can be more, can be more specific about that, but the amount of reserves that cities and counties are being asked to have on hand has been increasing uh, since 2008 with the debacle of the, of the, of the issues of, of property taxes and, and the mortgage crisis and so forth. So uh, the, the statutes are, uh, are in place, but they can be worked around by virtue of charter ordinances. Uh, and you can, it really becomes a matter of local decision. I think that is influenced most by uh, the, the, uh, the bond houses. If you want to go and issue debt, uh, then you're going to have to go ahead and prove that indeed you know, your, your bond ratios are within, within limits uh, that justifies them going and giving you the money. There are some communities that don't issue any debt at all. It's all pay as you go. Uh, and there are few and far between, but most most issue debt. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to maybe just hear you talk a little bit about city and county unification, because I it's there are a lot of different examples across the country, but I think the two in Kansas are very contrasted examples in terms of you have Greeley, which is the smallest by population, and then Wyandotte, which is the smallest by area, but the third or fourth by population and. Um, it's been in the news a little bit lately that the, some of the mayors in Wyandotte County are pushing for a reexamination of unification in that county. So just 
you know, it's an interesting point of discussion. Well, it is, uh, and I'm not, I'm not ignoring your question. I'll get to you at the, at the, at the point in just a second. Uh, I, I think um, what you see depends on where you sit, right? So I, out here in the West, where you have some counties that literally don't have enough people to go and do the roads. Uh, consolidation been talked about, but the legislature has made it so difficult to consolidate a county that it becomes a very high hill, high bar to go and achieve. Uh, and until the legislature allows to be, be more uh, flexible in, in that kind of consolidation, I don't think it's going to happen with any great frequency. And I think it's going to be that, that, uh, that because the identity people have. I'm from X county, and I, I was raised here in this county, and that's where my farm has been and so forth. I don't want to lose that identity. Um, that really is the driving factor, uh, I think, for against consolidation. The state of Kansas also requires and does pay for a judge being in each county. Um, so if you talk about consolidation, now you're talking about losing employment. One of the two's got to go, right? So there's that, that dynamic also. You got, you got two, you can, two county clerks, you got two county treasurers and so forth. So somebody's going to not be part of that, of that issue or that, that employment base, uh, which would be much more efficient, frankly, uh, but the politicians in charge, it's in their self-interest to maintain employment, right? Good people, as far as that, that that's that dynamic deal. That's, I think, in, in counties that are rural. And that's not just western Kansas, there's places also in southeast Kansas as well. For Wyandotte County, I think it's a different dynamic. It really is about revenue sharing uh, from what has come from uh, the issues of the legends. Um, and the deal that was struck in terms of the, how much money is being allocated to those communities uh, and, and, and the revenue that comes from, from those areas. So I think it's more of a negotiation of give me, a, give me a, a larger piece of the pie if you're Edwardsville or if you're Bonner Springs uh, than Kansas City. I don't, I don't suspect it really is a, uh, an earnest effort. I think it's more of a political move to kind of rattle sabers uh, to kind of get some more money out of the till is what I think the deal is. That's my impression. Um, so it's a totally different dynamic. I, I, I would be hard pressed to have them go back. I mean, if you're a Wyandotte County, you've got the best of both. You can use the state statutes for counties, you can use state statutes for cities to whatever your advantage is. Uh, so they, are, they have great flexibility. I can't see them really wanting, that the voters wanted to go and give that up. Let's talk about contracting out. And I think you, you give me some more substance to what you, what you were saying about the level of contracting out or Contracting out good or bad? Give me some more, more specifics. Oh, no, not the moment of aspect of whether or not contracting out is good or bad. More the level of variation between the counties and Kansas and why there might be variation. Uh, I think it, it, it does vary quite a bit, uh, I think, depending on the political desires of those involved and if you have staff. Um, if you are a smaller county, my, my, my perception is you don't have the necessary staff to go and do some of those services. You've got to contract them out because there's nobody else to do it. Stories that I've heard in some more remote rural counties is that they've had individual employees for the road crew, for example, that they had to fire for DUIs and so forth. They had to hire the same person back again because nobody else was available. So contracting out becomes a necessity as far as that's concerned. Um, there are issues of saying that you know, the, the, the county should go ahead or local governments should contract it out as a way to provide levels of, of revenue for small industries, the businesses in that area. Uh, so oftentimes the, the calculus between doing it yourself and contracting out is not done because there is a philosophical desire that indeed tax dollars should go out and be competed for in the private sector. So I think it's a matter of uh, those individuals uh, that are at uh, in the elected positions uh, what their preference is. Um, I think that there is a, the, the, the idea that um, if you can put pencil to paper and kind of do some more analysis, uh, you'd probably come to a better conclusion than just kind of saying we're going to do it and not do it. Um, some places just, just don't, don't, are preferring to go ahead and contract out because that's their, that's their philosophy. And if they don't have the people, they've got to go ahead and do it in some way to make, make the services happen. Best I can give you. Other questions? <clears throat> 